Um, I just want to welcome Dr. Jatla and all of the colleagues that have joined. And I'm going to hand over now to um, one of our interns here. Um, who's, you'll just introduce yourself when you start. Um, and we are going to start this meeting. Thank you, everybody. Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, this is our HIV case presentation. So, so my name is Ryan Donaldson. I'm a second year intern currently working in family medicine and at CMH, and I will be presenting a case that was seen in casualty on the 16th of the 4th, 2022. So just an outline for what's going to happen. We're going to go through the case presentation, the diagnosis, prevention, treatment, some closing remarks, and then just the references. So let's take a look at our case presentation. So Mrs. FT, a 30-year-old female with no known comorbidities, presents to casualty on the 16th of the 4th, 2022. She was seen at 1834 and triaged as a yellow patient with a complaint of shortness of breath and stomach cramps. At seven o'clock, according to the clinical notes, she was seen by the doctor who noted that the patient was reporting shortness of breath when waking up in the morning of the visit. She also reports having stomach cramps for two, two weeks ago, but this had resolved after getting treatment from the local clinic. The doctor that saw the patient did screening for constitutional symptoms as well as diarrhea, which were all negative at the time. So 10 minutes later, at 10 past seven, according to the clinical notes, the patient was asked about stress and at that moment they became emotional. <clears throat> when further asked, um, she, she admitted that her, she was currently being emotionally abused by her boyfriend and at that time didn't want to divulge any more information she also said that this is when she also gets shortness of breath, but she also admitted that she also gets shortness of breath when walking fast. So the vitals, as we can see there, the blood pressure is 114 over 95, a pulse of 103, a respiratory rate of 18, a temperature of 36.5, and saturating at 95% on room air. So I've highlighted the pulse as well as the respiratory rate because that's how the patient scored one point for each of those, as well as another point um, for being assisted. And then she scored three points, and that's why she was triaged as yellow. <clears throat> so the examination was otherwise unremarkable. She was only noted to have a tachypnea after talking about these emotional stresses. So the doctor at the time assessed the patient as having panic attacks with a possible underlying asthma. So the plan at that time was to do a chest x-ray and then review. So this is the chest x-ray from that uh, evening. So the chest x-ray was reviewed as homogeneous infiltrates bilaterally. And the assessment was a lower respiratory tract infection versus a COVID. So the plan was to do a COVID PCR swab, the patient to get the results via SMS, and then to discharge the patient on antibiotics, and it was noted that, that the psychologist details were given to the patient. So, Mrs. FT, the same patient, 30-year-old female, no known comorbidities, she presented to casualty then again on the 23rd of the 4th, 2022. This is around one week later. She was seen at 4.53 in the morning and triaged as an orange patient, complaining of shortness of breath, getting tired easily when walking a distance, as well as a left-sided chest pain that radiates down the left arm. She was seen two minutes later by the doctor, according to the clinical notes. So it was noted that the patient had received the antibiotics the week before and which the, under which the symptoms improved. Um, and now the patient is coming with a two-day history of shortness of breath, which is worse by exertion. The screening of, for constitutional symptoms, again, were negative. So on examination this time, the blood pressure was 122 over 67, a pulse rate of 132, a respiratory rate of 28, temperature of 38, saturation was 80% on room air, and then 100% on face mask oxygen. The patient on clinical examination was noted to be in distress, having tachypnea with mild reduced air entry on the right-hand side. It also noted that the patient walked to the sink 
and the saturation dropped to 70%. So the assessment was this patient has exertional dyspnea with a query lower respiratory tract infection versus PCP if HIV positive. So the plan at the time was to do a chest x-ray, bloods, ECG, and to place the patient on face marks oxygen 60% as she was still in distress, even though she was saturating at 100%. So this is the second chest x-ray a week later. Um, so the x-ray review, the, patient, uh, the doctor reviewed the x-ray saying that there was extensive infiltrates bilaterally this patient was then discussed with the physician on call and handed over at 5.38 in the morning. So the bloods that were done, these were the negative findings or the findings that were positive, sorry. So the CRP um, on inflammatory marker was 127. The HIV ELISA, the first one was positive and then the laboratory confirmatory was positive as well. The CD4 uh, count came back as 28. The reflex clat was negative. And now the COVID PCR, this is times two because the first one that was done as well as the a second one was done on the second uh, presentation. So it was at this point that the patient was then diagnosed with PCP and admitted uh, to the ward. So the final diagnosis for this patient was an HIV state, uh, WHO stage four HIV disease due to this PCP pneumonia or an advanced HIV disease. So retrospectively, what could have possibly pointed us to this diagnosis on the first presentation? So whenever thinking of COVID, the NICD's first paragraph under uh, COVID management and suspects includes that the differential diagnosis for the syndrome is broad and that we must always include or consider bacterial pneumonia, tuberculosis, as well as PCP if they are immunocompromised and then to manage accordingly. So looking back on it, is there anything that could have told us or suggested to us that this patient was uh, immunocompromised to the point where they could have had PCP? So looking back at the x-ray, I've highlighted that the red lines just present uh, the subcutaneous tissue that was on this patient. So it's important to note that in our setting, uh, South Africa has a... Um, an obesity rate of 31% in males and 68% in females. So we need to have a high index of suspicion as these patients might have lost a lot of weight, even though they don't look like it on presentation. It's just to think out of our uh, normal thinking of the almost cachexic stage four um, HIV patient. So PCP or PJP. And I said, hold on, what PJP? What happened to PCP? So PCP pneumocystis carini pneumonia was a misnomer of the organism, which was corrected to P, uh, pneumocystis gerovechi pneumonia, um, but the disease process itself is still called PCP. So pneumocystis itself is a fungus and it is an atypical fungus. This means that it cannot be cultured. Its life cycle consists of three forms, a trophic form, a pre-cystic form, and a cystic form. The trophic form, is what um, predominates during infection. So the primary mode of transmission is airborne. Um, they say that primary infection occurs in 75% of people before the age of four, and that pneumocystis almost exclusively exists in the alveola of our lungs. The trophic form first uh, attaches to the lung epithelial cells, this interaction causes both proliferation of the pneumocystis as well as activates our immune response, which is our alveolar macrophages. They activate phagocytosis, respiratory bursts, and inflammatory response. This is mediated by our CD4 uh, T cells. So the immune system response will be impaired in immunosuppressed persons. So this is just a, a, a picture I got from up to date, just to give a, a better understanding of what happens during the an, an, a pneumonia picture uh, on the smaller scale. So we can see that the alveola comes inflamed and filled with this fluid. Um, and this is what causes our patients to cough and to have shortness of breath. So 
PCP or PJP can exist in both the HIV negative and the HIV positive patient. So important things to consider in the HIV negative population is our cancer patients, especially hematological, uh, severe malnutrition, prematurity, solid organ transplant, as well as immunosuppressive drugs. In the HIV positive population, some of the risk factors we'll look at is the CD4 cell count, or CD4 count, CD4 cell percentage, if the presence of oral thrush or candida, and previous PCP. I just, uh, so we're going to focus on the positive population going forward. So I've included this at the bottom because we always look at the absolute cell count and we forget that the cell percentage count is also present on our laboratory tests. As, as you can see from this one, it's 2.9%. So if we look at the incidence, the incidence of PJP in HIV increases as the CD4 cell count decreases. Most cases occur when CD4 cell count, uh, CD4 count is less than 200. There's also an association with a CD4 cell count less than 14%. So remember that most cases of PJP or PCP now occur in patients who are unaware of the infection or who are not receiving ongoing care for HIV or have advanced disease. So I've included this table just to give us an idea of at what level of our CD4 count do we get the different types of opportunistic infections. So at, on the left-hand side, you can see the CD4 cell count or CD count. And on the bottom is the time after infection. The graph in the middle represents where the CD4 count will be at the unit of time. And at the top, we can see seroconversion, asymptomatic, symptomatic, as well as AIDS. Um, and when we look at this, we can see that PCP um, is occurring around the 200 mark of our CD4 cell count. So this graph is just to highlight that majority of our cases uh, occur below 200 uh, CD4 count and then below uh, a cell count of 14% but there are still other um, cases present above 200 um, count as well as CD4 cells uh, percentage count above 14%. So the clinical manifestations of PJP or PCP usually present subacutely with progressive dyspnea and a dry cough with symptom duration less than 12 weeks. So the, the most common symptoms is generally a gradual onset, a fever, a cough and a progressive dyspnea on exertion, as well as oxygen desaturation at rest or with exercise. When looking on chest x-ray, it depends on the severity. X-ray findings can range from completely normal ground glass appearance uh, bilaterally to severe cystic infiltrates and even a pneumothorax. So ground glass appearance, we must always also remember COVID. So, the diagnosis in our uh, setting is normally clinical. However, there are laboratory examinations and investigations that we can do to aid our diagnosis. But in our resource setting, they are not really, that, uh, not really indicated. So diagnosis can be aided by either visualizing the pathogen, this would be PCP or pneumocystis, via immunofluorescent staining, measure, measuring the presence and or quantity of DNA present of the pathogen, measuring the beta uh, D-glucan levels in the serum, as well as measuring serum LDH levels, or we can use improved imaging such as high resolution CT scans. So the PCR or measuring the presence of DNA and quantifying it does not differentiate between colonization and infection. And the values for the quantity have not yet been confirmed. So measuring serum B beta D-glucan levels has a, a sensitivity of 92%, but a specificity of 78% in the HIV positive population, as well as it is quite expensive and is also affected by other organisms. So what specimens can we send in for stains? So our first specimen that we can send in is an induced sputum but it has a sensitivity of less than 50% or more than 90%. Our second uh, specimen is a bronchial, a bronchial alveolar lavage, 
which has a sensitivity of 90% to 99%. And then our third specimen is a biopsy. This can be bronchotracheal or a lung biopsy, but also is associated with other uh, risk factors with doing that. And we can see that sensitivity is around 95 to 100% for both of those. What's important to remember is the induced sputum at, uh, for PCP is not the same as a spontaneous sputum that, is, uh, that we use for gene experts in TB. So the sensitivity and specificity for respiratory samples for PCP depend on the stain being used, the experience of the microbiologist or the pathologist, the pathogen load, and the specimen quality. So when we look at a differential diagnosis for PCP or PJP, TB, non-tuberculosis mycobacterium, toxoplasmosis, CMB, COVID, and Kaposi sarcoma are amongst some of the common. So if we have to take a look at differentiating between three of our common differential opportunistic infections, so according to the clinical guidelines for hospitalized adults in advanced HIV disease, they look at TB, bacterial pneumonia, and PJP or PCP. So they split it up into the features, meaning the symptom duration, the hypoxia, um, the presence of a hypoxia, the HB, the white cell count, and chest x-ray. So I've noted on in red there the things that help differentiate PC, PCP. Um, is a duration less than 12 weeks, um, and that hypoxia is common in PCP, as well as the chest uh, x-ray will show infil interstitial infiltrates. It's important to know that also in COVID, you will also have hypoxia as well as these interstitial infiltrates. So what's also important is, in fact, approximately 13 to 18% of patients with documented PCP have another concurrent cause of the pulmonary dysfunction, such as TB, Kaposi sarcoma, or a bacterial pneumonia. So how do we treat it? Our drug of choice is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Um, and in, in our setting, there are, well, there are two drug choices or two uh, variants. It's a single string and a double string. For us, we have a single string tablet in our public health setting. And according to our EML guidelines, you can uh, give the dosage according to the weight. So the single strength would be our um, tablet on the left. So according to the weights on the left, and you give those tablets six hourly for three weeks. Another way of thinking about it is you can dose it at uh, one tablet per four kilograms with a maximum um, of 16 tablets, and those are given in divided doses, six to eight hourly for the duration of 21 days. So remember adjusting your doses in renal impairment. So this table just gives us an idea uh, of the single strength dose. So if your EGFR is more than 30, uh, 30, then there's no need to adjust. If it's between 15 to 30, you reduce the dose by 50%, 50%. And if lower than 15, you can reduce the dose to 75%. So adverse reactions are hypersensitivity reactions, clostridium difficile infection, drug-induced liver injury, hematological effects, hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia, as well as hyponatremia. So we're going to focus on the hypersensitivity reactions, which are to Steven Johnson syndrome, as well as toxic epidermal necrolysis. So it is important to know that any hypersensitivity reaction to any sulfur drug, trimethoprim, or any component of the formulation is a contraindication to its use. So <clears throat> our alternative uh, treatments for PCP, uh, Dapsone 100 milligrams daily, plus the trimethoprim component, if they're not having a hypersensitive reaction. Um, and then uh, primaquin, 30 milligrams, clindamycin, 450 milligrams, six hourly, or 608 hourly. And then a tibiquone, uh, 750 milligrams, uh, 12 hourly with food. So this is our alternative treatment. And what is the role for steroids in PCP? So in moderate to severe cases that meet the criteria, of a partial pressure of oxygen at less than 70 milligrams of mercury or alveolar arterial 
uh, different gradient um, of more than uh, 35 milli uh, millimeters of mercury. So we give the prednisone as 40 milligrams uh, per os for two, uh, two times a day for days one to five, and then 40 milligrams once a day from day six to 10, and then 20 milligrams per os once a day from day 11 to 20. It is very important to start the uh, steroids as soon as possible or within 72 hours of initiating the PCP treatment. So when it comes to prevention, when it comes to prevention, we look at exposure prevention and disease prevention. Exposure prevention is a question of isolation um, because of the airborne transmission, but there is actually no standard uh, data that, there's no data that supports it as a standardized practice. Um, and then in disease prevention, who should get prophylaxis or uh, prevention? Is a CD4 count less than 200 or CD4 cell count percentage less than 14%? And then what is our drug of choice? Again, it is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. And it's our single strength tablet, one tablet per day. So prophylaxis continues until your CD4 cell count, a CD4 count is more than 200, or you can consider with a CD4 count between 100 and 200 in which they are virologically suppressed from three to six months. So why do opportunistic infections still occur? So some of the reasons we can see is that there's a late diagnosis or missed presentations, suboptimal adherence to ARVs or prophylaxis, um, delayed identification of ARVs, uh, ARV failure, sorry, immunological disconnect, and functional immune reconstitution. So thank you very much all for your time, and please feel free to ask any questions. These are some of my references, and this is the slides go that I used to create this presentation. Thank you. For this presentation, I think that you made justice to the topic and was very comprehensive. So one of the things that I learned from this topic is, uh, is still, there is a lot of people in our community that they don't know their status. And for that reason, we are still receiving people who are severely immunocompromised and in advanced stage of the disease. And the only way to prevent that is make a habit that irrespective of the reason of the consultation. I mean, if the patient is coming for family planning, if the patient is coming for hypertension, diabetes, even tonsillitis, offer the screening to all of our patients, okay? For the most common infection conditions that are prevalent in our setting, that is HIV and TB. So this one is going to be the only way that we can pick up the patients in early stage linkage to care, and of course, we are going to prevent all of this complication. So in relation with this topic, it's very important to remember the monitor of these patients because, I mean, Bactrin can have some adverse effects. So remember to monitor the patient with the full blood count and the renal function because the patient can have hyperkalemia, can have some a, a renal impairment. And in relation with the hematological complication, you can pick up thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, neutropenia, aplastic, hemolytic anemia, and megaloblastic anemia. So be careful with that. So with that, we are going to open the session, okay, for comments and inputs. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, and, there, and there are tests that you can do to aid the diagnosis. In our setting here, I just wanted to know which ones, because you talked about biopsies and that. Is that all available? Which ones? 
Yeah. Um, I do know that we do have a beta D glucan serum uh, measurement at, at our facility, but it's quite costly. Um, oh, with, it's, sorry, I'm, I'm getting, we don't do serum beta D glucans. Um, and then, so let's, let's hand it over to Dr. Adene. Sure. Oh. It's it's so yes so so it is a very expensive test it is available so it's uh, not really advised because of how expensive it is and that it uh, also doesn't have a, a good uh, specificity um, and then we do also do uh, uh, the PCP PCRs um, but again it's it's like I said it doesn't differentiate between colonization and infection so. It's, it's, not, it's not really that indicated in our setting, it's more clinical diagnosis. In a symptomatic, in a, in a symptomatic patient, the patient that comes in acutely distressed and needs the triad for PJP, the patient that's progressing for exceptional disdain, uh, coughing, having fever, with evidence of immunosuppression and again, low CD4 can be able to address PJP is probably number one that should come to our mind regularly. And the recommendation is if you think of PJP, please touch it. Um, the results then comes back later and you can then adjust your, your management mm -hmm. of the patient thereafter. Um, but the DGLAC is quite very expensive. Previously, it used to be a sent out uh, investigation, but I'm glad it's available. But again, um, if any available influence from the oral pharynx of the patient will probably be your first choice. Uh, PCR, irrespective of whether it doesn't differentiate, if somebody is actually thinking of it, PCR is positive, that, was, that will be applicable to okay. our diagnosis of, of PJP. But coming back to the first question you asked, you know, the patient came in with just a brief moment of shortness of breath that occurred in the morning, and the vital seemingly was stable on the mm -hmm. river. And that was still during the period we had few cases of uh, COVID. So readily, they, without history of immunosuppression on arrival, river, I'm sure most likely eight out of 10 doctors will have thought of COVID. Mm -hmm. And if the patient did not meet criteria for severe uh, COVID, then the patient gets swabbed and sent back home on antibiotics. But again, we had prepared, uh, we had prepared a, a, more like a safety meeting for our patients in which patients are given uh, a take home uh, information, patient information sheets in terms of whether the condition of the patient is deteriorating or worsening, the patient should then represent back to the facility. Perhaps that could be the reason why the patient came back. And at its second, even the initial- Who does I see the so the initial, the initial chest history was actually not conclusive, you know, in terms of uh, guiding the initial doctor in making decisions as to um, whether the patient should, should have been kept, you know, respiratory rate of 18, and with history of a mission outburst during the consultation, um, it, it's quite a very challenging one. I know we had the had discussion with Dave, and he thought maybe we should actually do, uh, you know, make the, do more like uh, exercise the patient to see if they, there will be repeats of the uh, effort intolerance in the patient. But again, I think the initial uh, assessment of immunosuppression would have actually assisted us more on arrival if the patient had been previously diagnosed. But again, they if we look at the first uh, COVID guideline, HIV test is actually recommended because they, you know, you do not want to miss, uh, uh, you know, respiratory infections uh, in patients with HIV in this category of patients. But by and large, I think it's an opportunity for us to learn and improve our practice.
Thank you, Dr. Adenay. We have another comment from Dr. Stead. Morning, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. I've, I've just been joining on, on Zoom. Um, and uh, that's very, very well and clearly presented. And I think thanks, thanks for discussing the case. I think it is useful um, as a learning case. Um, and I think, you know, a key thing, so obviously here, a lady presenting with, you know, advanced HIV, despite she, she you know, I think as you alluded to, she, she, was, she wasn't wasted. She didn't have sort of obvious, uh, sort of from end of the bed stigma of HIV. She, she looked fairly normal. Uh, young lady and uh, just presenting with this this first respiratory presentation um, and, I, and I think really key that we don't let patients come through our casualties and through our OPDs and, and we miss HIV so that you know there's obviously lots of reasons you know why hasn't this lady tested before primary care um, and uh, but but when when we get when they do come to, into our facility, we must be offering routine HIV testing. And I know it's a bit of that's maybe a discussion for another day in terms of the logistics of that. We did a, a study with um, some American colleagues in the pre casualty um, where we offered we had a team and um, that was actually to, uh, to pretty much twenty four seven and um, of counselors that that offered everyone that came into the casualty trauma medicine offered them HIV testing. There was very high uptake of people that were approached. Most of them were willing to be tested. And, uh, and we found we diagnosed 6% um, of patients tested with undiagnosed HIV. Overall, there was 25% uh, of patients coming through casualty doors are HIV positive. And quite a lot of those were sort of young males with trauma, so you know, not coming in with a medical complaint at all. Obviously, the, the pickup in medical complaints as much was, was higher than the trauma patients. But um, basically, just making the point that there's definitely room to to try and catch, you know, HIVs that come through come through our doors, um, and that you know, an HIV diagnosis can completely change the you know the, the, the direction of the workup and the and the and the differential, which which you know this case demonstrates. And so it was a pity that was missed the first. Unfortunately, you know, she had a good outcome. So I met her on the on the admission. With the second presentation, we diagnosed the PCP, and and uh, and she she fortunately responded well to cotrimoxazole and prednisone. In pneumocystis, we we other people are aware that you know it actually does have quite a high mortality, especially when they present late, and and unfortunately we don't uh, ventilate them in ICU because of poor outcomes. We've occasionally sort of accidentally ventilated the PCP, and they really don't do well, um, and they they usually eventually sort of crash on ventilators. So so their best prognosis is if they get diagnosed early, um, I mean, ideally prevented, uh, that they don't, we don't let their CD4s drop low because we get them onto ALVs and we get them onto uh, Bactrim prophylaxis where appropriate. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole 1990-90 targets would, would pretty much eradicate pneumocystis in our context. Um, but, but at least the ones that do develop pneumocystis, that there's a high index of suspicion, diagnosed early, put onto treatment, um, and then they, they should do well. Um, so I think that's that's really the value of this meeting. I think for for nurses, uh, doctors have a, a, you know anyone complaining of shortness of breath, you must consider PCP, especially if they're HIV positive, especially if the CD4 is under two hundred. We do occasionally see PCPs above two hundred, but but the bulk are are in the lower CD4 category. Um, sorry, I, I, I wrote down a few points. I hope you care if I carry on. Um, that so so I mean the the you know obviously. It's you know it's easy to to kind of twenty twenty uh, retrospective vision is is twenty twenty um, but if you're making psychosomatic diagnosis of a of panic attacks it, it's always a diagnosis of exclusion you must exclude the organic I think the first X ray was quite clearly ground glass I think doctors are sometimes not good at picking up ground glass we better at sort of seeing things you know nodules you know opacities but um but actually you need to i think doctors need to be more sensitive to looking at a background pattern that is abnormal you know stepping back from an x-ray this, this is clearly abnormal one of the early signs is you lose vascular markings um and uh, and this is clearly just an x-ray that just looks the background looks abnormal which is it's, it's actually a sort of textbook ground glass x-ray 
Um, and, and in the, I think what Nels, uh, Vincent was alluding to was quite a useful trick, especially in this of outpatients where you maybe someone's got some mild shortness of breath, the sets are normal, is to exercise and get them to walk up and down your passage uh, briskly um, for a minute or so, and then you check their sets again. And if they drop their sets, that's, that's definitely abnormal. So I think she was probably, you know, just coping with her sets of 95 when she first came in. I, I wonder if her respiratory rate was really 18. Uh, some of those triage numbers aren't correct. Um, and uh, and you know maybe walking her, she, we may have seen her desaturate at that point. Um, yeah, I think Doug, just be wary of giving antibiotics, treating an X-ray. X-ray. I mean, she didn't have a cough. Uh, I think it was a presentation. What really wasn't for a bacterial pneumonia, bronchitis. Um, and yeah, and those those are my main points. So we we did so obviously we've seen a, a, you know hundreds of COVID X-rays over the last waves and the COVID, it, it can be ground glass. It's actually different to the PCP and the PCP is a more diffuse ground glass like this one. It, it kind of seems to spare the apices. It's actually just because there's less lung up in the apices. And um, it's fairly diffuse where the COVID ground glass tended to be more peripheral and basal, but there, there's a whole variation. So, I mean, you can't put your head on a block, but we, we definitely, there's kind of a, there's a more typical COVID ground glass and there's a more typical, PCP ground glass. Um, and, and just in terms of the diagnostics, so, so for most cases, I mean, obviously in medicine, we admitting the sicker ones and treating. For most, we don't send diagnostics and that a, that a typical clinical radiological picture is enough and we definitely have a low threshold to treat. Um, and, uh, and, and most will respond to the bacterium and the steroids. If it's in cases where it's, it's more atypical and, and the trickier ones are the ones with abnormal x-rays. So when they've got I mean, I mean, background x-rays, if they got a lot of our patients with chronic lung disease, post-TB, maybe they got COPD, and now they're getting, you think they're getting pneumocystis on top, and then you don't get the classic crown glass because the lungs are abnormal, and you have to sort of uh, think out the box a bit more. Um, and, and so in those difficult cases, um, maybe if it's going to affect a decision about whether the patient goes to ICU, we, we do find the BTD glucan quite useful, or you can induce the sputum. They do, uh, that sends to different labs, and sometimes they give you the, the PCR, and sometimes they give you the, the DFAT, which is the fluorescent antigen test. Um, and I think you've discussed the sort of limitation. So, but, you know, where you've got a cl strong clinical suspicion, a negative sputum test, you, you wouldn't stop pneumocystis treatment. Um, but if it's... Uh, yeah, where, where you've got, um, you know, if you've got diagnostic doubts and maybe the patient's having a bad reaction to the bacterium and you're really wondering, you know, am I helping or harming? Sometimes these tests can can help sort of uh, rule in or rule out to some degree, but but it's not not routine. So I think in most cases, uh, low threshold for trial of therapy um, is is the way to go and most most respond. Thanks. I think I'll stop there. I hope I haven't used up too much time. Thank you very much, Dr. Estet. Uh, I will really appreciate your inputs. If there is any other comments or questions? No. Yes, Dr. Jack. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for the presentation and uh, and thank you very much for your uh, points, uh, Doc, especially on saying that all patients must have an HIV test if status is unknown or they don't have a recent uh, negative test uh, uh, so that they can be appropriately linked to care with the monitoring of all the necessary systems. However, what I wanted to ask was, uh, I think I saw CD4 count 28 or something there. I wanted to ask if the laboratories do the re reflex cryptococcal uh, uh, testing for, 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 for these patients. Uh, I didn't see any. I'm busy uh, with other things in between, sorry, because I'm managing uh, these people as well who are complaining. And and also just because it's it's one area that I, I want us to stress in these immunocompromised patients who have a, a, a low CD4 count that, amongst others, PCP being one, but cryptococcal as well, can can we ensure that uh, people look for it uh, if if the laboratory has not done the reflex test that they ask for it and check for all of these before sending the patient home because we hear now that this patient had come in. 
and and they were seen as, as as psychosomatic, sent home, and came back again. And we see this low CD4 count. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for your um, your question, Doc. Um, so um, they did do the reflex CD4. Uh, uh, when the CD4 cell count was low, the, the, you can see the serum clat was negative. So they did do that um, just to uh, let you know. The bloods were done on the second presentation and not on the first presentation. Um, so um, yeah, the bloods once on second presentation, then they were reviewed by the, the physician. Um, these were the results that, that were uh, positive. Okay, thanks. No problem, thank you. You. I just want to emphasize and remember to all of us that as we were discussing the last meeting, remember that the LISA is not our first uh, screening test for our patients, very expensive. And you need to uh, uh, wait for the results, maybe two or three days and ask the patient to come back. Remember that our first slice of screening is the rapid test. So in that way, the patient can go home with the proper result and counseling without create anxieties and concern until they receive the result with the LISA. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, please? Any questions? People are thinking, just a quick reminder for CPD points, you would need to put your information in the chat. Make sure you add your email address. So please, your name, um, your job title, your organization, and your email address. The chat is our attendance register for this meeting. Thank you. Um, yeah, it looks like there's no more questions. Um, please make sure you put your information in the chat. Um, Dr. Jakla, are you happy that we close or do you have any last comments? No, thank you very much, uh, Madeline and Tim. It was a very good presentation. Uh, there, uh, there are no comments from my side. We may close off. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm going to leave the meeting open for a couple of minutes just for people to make sure they've got their information in the chat and make sure you have put your email address in um, and then we'll officially, um, but the meeting has ended now. Thank you very much for everybody that attended. Thank you very much for Dr. Donaldson and Dr. Yusimi for preparing this presentation. <laughs>